Let's uh, get rolling along. So, who can tell me what this is? I didn't. I didn't put a a, a title on it. So you have to you have to know or guess. What what particularly about yeah. the system chapel? You know what it's called? That's right. The creation of Adam. Yeah. And it was painted just not that it matters by Michelangelo. And what do you think it represents? It is called the creation of Adam. So that's God, that's Adam. He noticed in the shape of a brain. Right. And what does it tell us about how we think about creativity? So we are the well I think it means that we're the only um, people like in existence to be able to think and have a higher self. So, for example, if you think about it, animals, they're just like, oh, so we bought a shelter, don't die. Then humans, they have the power to design and self-actualize and bring themselves higher. So, that, that's what makes us different, and uh, that's what the Chinese does. Do you think that's what they believed at the time, that we're, that we're, the, that we're self-actualizing and that we're, we're creating the world? Yeah, because then they have so much back then. So, I think that... Well, if you think about it, how technology has um, improved in the past decade, especially with Steve Jobs, Apple, all these phones and uh, computers, um, it has gone up really fast. Mm -hmm. But if you think about back then, when, for example, like Michael was creating in those statues and the uh, cities that they were making, um, that was pretty uh, fast growth for that time period, too. So, anybody else could have thought about that? I think, shy. I think if you're like thinking like a, like a Christian like back then, you would say that um, the works that you do derive from something. And it's kind of like how you're saying that um, we're supposed to be like considering like a, something bigger and like we're encompassed by something. So it kind of represents that. It's like, well, if if I'm a Christian and I believe that um, my works are poor God or from God, then it can be like how we're designing things. Well, I'm just deriving things from the environment. So, again, there's no right answer, but the, at the time, and this is in the, the 17th century, um, the general belief was that the, the earth is the center of the universe. Everything revolves around the earth. God made everything. And it's, it's not just necessarily Christian um, creation stories. We go to pretty much any tradition anywhere in the world uh, at the time. Um, continue to today, you'll find creation stories that place the agency for creation in some high, high power. Some, somebody else made it all. If you read the creation story of the Bible, of the, of, of the Jewish and Christian Bible, the Judeo Christian Bible, you'll read, read a story where there was a six days of frenzied create, creativity, there was the Garden of Eden, and that was it. Right? There's no suggestion of, well, this is how Adam and Eve got their clothes, and this is how Adam and Eve made structures, and this is how Adam and Eve made cities. It's just they were created, and that was the end of the, the discussion of creativity. So I'm, I'm introducing this because I want us to think a little bit in this next hour or so about the consciousness, the awareness that we bring into the creative process. Right? Because the, what we think and what we believe the values that we hold actually have as much impact on what we design and how we design it as all of the beautiful design thinking that I've been talking about up to now. It's really, really important. It's very essential that we have a coherent methodology, just as we can do science with a scientific method, that we have a coherent design methodology. And that's really important. But you can design, well, I'll move, move on. And so the, the belief system, if you like, that we hold now, that's quite different than what Michelangelo probably believed as he was, 
is, he was uh, paint, making that painting is that we live in a world not just of nature, which we do, but we live in a world of artifacts. An artifact is a fancy word for stuff, things. A chair is an artifact, a piece of item of clothes is an artifact. An artifact is any item that is created by the human imagination. It's got the word art in it, just like in making paintings on walls. But all art, what we call art today, is a very narrow portion of what the, the, the ancients called art. What they called art was anything that was made with human skill. Anything. A painting, a horse saddle, a nail, um, a chair, anything, right? It all requires art, human skill. The word art in that sense is made by human skill. And an artifact is an object, an item that is made with human skill. So we live in a world of artifacts. I mean, look around this room. I don't see anything much of nature. Everything that we're surrounded by, everything we're sitting on, everything we, that's covering us is, is made as an artifact. It's made with human skill. And that every artifact, whether we pay attention to it that way or not, is designed. Right? Somebody sat down and thought about what this chair should be. Somebody sat down and thought about what this room should be where that light should be placed, how that light would work, how to turn that, 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 that projector on and off. Somebody thought about it all, right? So just to say everything is an artifact and every artifact is designed is a new awareness that we have that Michelangelo didn't. Right? He still lived in the note, in the, in the field that we were living in a world that is created by God, by, by some higher being. And it's up to the higher being, whether it's good or bad for us. Right? If it's bad for us, well, that's just the way it was made. The notion that you can systematically go around the built environment or the made environment and, and make it better is a, is a new consciousness. Along with it comes this, the, the third assumption of, of, that, I, that I call the assumptions of design consciousness or present design consciousness is that not every artifact is designed well. Just because it's designed, somebody sat down and thought about it and they made something. But what they made might be really damaging. It might be really bad for us. It might be really ill-conceived. It might be made with really bad intention to hurt somebody. Uh, so the question of what we consider to be well-designed and bad design, badly designed, is very often not just a question of technical proficiency, but it's a question of values. Is it good or is it bad? But anything can be designed well. That's the premise of design thinking. We can take, uh, put our design attention to anything we want to, right? Including relationships, including human experience, including human behaviors. We can design them all. We can design entire economies. We can, we can redesign the economic system we live in. We can design anything, right? And we can do it well because we have a clear method and we know theoretically what we're doing. But then there's this idea of good design, not designed well, but what is good design? The minute we put the word good onto something, we're implying a value judgment. Right? If I say that's good, I, I means I, by my value estimate, it's really good. Not everybody might agree with me. Right? Who's, who's seen a movie that you thought was brilliant and you said, that's a great movie, that's a good movie, and somebody said it was a terrible movie. Right? So we, we've been obsessed, ever since we've been talking about design, we've been obsessed with ideas, what is good design? And because good design was very often thought to be the domain of aesthetically oriented designers, it was very often thought that good design or bad design is, a, is an aesthetic judgment. But I want to talk about today is that it's not actually an aesthetic judgment, it's an ethical judgment. And I want to talk about a little bit of what kinds of ethical judgments. So here is a, an example of the kind of architecture that comes out of classically trained architecture trainers. This is a building down in Los Angeles. Has anyone visited this building? Is it in LA? It's the Disney Theater. 
you have? It's fabulous, right? Is it good? Yeah. It's gorgeous, but is it good? No, I think So it, it was designed by a very, very well-known uh, architect by the name of Frank Gehry. Um, and it is gorgeous, and it is stunning. It, it takes your breath away. And there's fierce arguments. Uh, I happen to personally, my value system tells me this is wonderful and I call it good architecture. But there are ve vehement ar arguments about that. There are people who say this is trash, it's terrible, it's, a, it's a, an offense to, to, to spend that much money on something that has no usefulness at all. Right? So that comes from a value system which says use value is much more important than anything else. And especially if it's a use that is useful to me, but if it's useful to you as somebody else who is not me, yeah, that's not so good. Right? Here's another example. Is this good design or is this bad design? Right? I'll read you the, the, the uh, title. It's the, the gas chamber at the New Mexico State Penitentiary. It is very well designed. Right? It does exactly what it was meant to do. It kills people. Is that good design? Well, a lot of the answer to that question kind of depends on your belief system around capital punishment. If you believe as a society that we should be killing people to bring them to justice, whatever that might mean to you, then this is a perfectly good design. If you do not think that, if you are th think that killing people in, as a state uh, to keep them in line with the rules of the state is a bad idea, then this is a terrible design. Right? So good design, bad design. So here is a consequence of a design process. This is in Moscow. It's a beautifully designed city with some of the most stunningly stunning architecture in the world in it. And it's a hellhole to live in. You can't breathe. Is that good design or is that bad design? Was serious consideration given to the design that created the city that you can barely breathe in? Why is that? Why is it that they can't breathe? Is it smog? Not pollution? It's just, I mean, I, I don't know this. The, I've been in other cities that have suffered from that, and usually it's an inversion, and you've got a lot of cars running around, and, yep, and you okay. don't anticipate inversion effects of the, of the climate, then you trap smog it's kind of like in. Solid city, you yeah. like that. LA used to be like that. Mm -hmm. San Francisco used to be a lot more like that until EPA cleaned things up. Um, a number of American cities used to have much less now it's still not great um london was very famous for having what they called the peace of the fogs in the in the early part of the 20th century where you they literally couldn't go outdoors you could die and they had to clean that up because they there they, they warmed the city people warmed their homes like burning wood and coal and so much pollution and that combined with the particular fog effect of, of fog coming in off, off the river, that would make it almost impossible to see more than a foot in front of your face. So are those design decisions or are those just randomly occurring events that you have some places that are unlivable, that we've created by, as a human artifact? The city is a particular kind of human artifact. We build big cities all around the world and we live there. We build them for ourselves to make life good, right? Well, that, right? This is, these are oil fields burning in the desert, right? I mean, it's just, I, I, I picked this as an image just of, you know, you, it, it, it's hellish, right? And yet it's entirely a, an artifact of human creativity. Somebody created the conditions that produced that, right? It's a design, outcome. Climate change is a designed outcome, right? It's a design decision to use carbon fuels to 
energize our economy, produced an incredible economy, and, and we're, in, we're in a point where it might destroy human civilization. Right? It's, it's, we're, on a, we're on a collision course, let's put it that way. And so what is, is the, the way we even create the industries that we live in, is that a design outcome? Right. So, the key word in all of these things is they were all done by design. Now, we use the term by design in the English language kind of casually. We just flip it out and go, oh, that was, that was done by design. You hear it in the news all the time. So, so did members of Congress did such and such by design to get you know, the president to do such and such. Right? What is it? What does by design mean? It doesn't mean we're sitting down and, and making nice drawings and drawing beautiful opera houses and, uh, and, and gas chambers, right? It means we're doing something with very good. purpose is another one, intention, purpose. Those are the terms that we most often refer use to relate to this term by design. And it has everything to do with what we're doing in design thinking. We're making stuff intentional. I like to, to use an aphorism that says, design is how we turn our intentions into reality. Our forms, our intentions, we give, we give form to our intentions. Right? It's, a, it's a deliberate process, an intentional process. Which doesn't which me, doesn't mean there can't be terrible and terrible terrible unintended consequences, and one of the things that we do when we learn and accept at a, at a level of consciousness that everything is designed and everything must be designed well, we can't just put things out in the world and say don't worry about the consequences we we don't have to worry about that that's what somebody else will clean up later. Part of designing things is taking very deep and careful and deliberate methodical uh, consideration of the intentions, the ones that we intend and the unintended outcomes, the smog, the, the, fire, the fire burning in the desert. Those are the unintended consequences. Nobody sat down and said, oh, I wonder how we can create the most polluted city in the world. Or I wonder how we can, how might we uh, design a, uh, a hellish scene in a desert around uh, oil facilities, right? That wasn't the intention, but unintended consequences are just as important as the intentions. The intentions are what come from out of our conscious belief system about what we want, what is desirable, what is necessary, what is needed. Right? These are the, the things which we'll be exploring. So all of that I refer to as design consciousness. It relates very closely to working consciously when we design things to think out, not just outside of the box, but outside of our narrow, narrow bubble of assumption. Right? We have to do that if we're going to design consciously. Otherwise, we're just sort of going, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And, it, and I'm not going to worry about all these unintended consequences. Well, that's, that's not part of how we design well. And, and that opens us up to what we're going to talk more about. Oops. Um, okay, so this just does it like that, which we're going to talk about ethical innovation. How do we actually give ethical consideration to the things we're designing while we're designing them? Right? It, just, it doesn't have to be designed well, it has to be good. And by good by whose standards? That's a question I can't give you the answer to. I'm going to hopefully help you ask the right questions so that you will learn to, to ask the questions and come up with the answers for yourself. Right? I can't tell you what the right answer is any more than I can tell you who to vote for in the next election uh, or what, the, what is good in writ large or bad writ, writ, writ large. I've got obviously clear and very forceful ideas about that. But those are my, my ideas, and, and I'm happy to share them, but I'm not going to insist that you all think the same as me. So 
design consciousness is the underlying belief system that we hold around what's even possible when we design things. Remember the first question on the values survey that I gave you last week was something to the effect of do you believe that we can make the improve the world by design? Right? And some of you said no, and some of you said yes. Those are very, very different belief systems around the power and the potential of the of human creativity. Can we deliberately and intentionally make things better? If we don't believe that, right, I'm, I'm hoping to inspire you to believe that because we have to believe that because we're making everything. We better believe that we can make it better. And as Albert Einstein uh, famously said, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them, right? I think the perspective of design thinking is here is a different way of thinking that existed when we created all these issues that we're talking about and we continue to create them today. I mean, it's not like, I'm just naming the, the, the top uh, kinds of issues that come in for ethical consideration, but there are thousands of others like should we be using cars as much which you know should we be uh, using vape pens for tobacco products that have got flavorings in them is that a good thing or a bad thing should we be um how should we be organizing housing in in cities where there's a need for low-cost housing right next to high-cost housing how do we do use these devices to generate uh apps that we can you know, I'm sure in the course of this, this semester, many people are going to be saying, oh, let's design, here's a need and let's design an app. Is that a good thing? What, is the, what are the ethical concerns around that and how do we think about it in the context of the creative processes that we're going to be uh, executing? So for me to really get to the bottom of the, this creative thing that we're doing requires really understanding where it comes from. Where, why did we even design things in the first place? Where did this, need, this urge that we have, this insatiable urge to create new things, where did it even come from? Well, you can go way back to when we, or some very, very, very distant ancestors of ours came down from the trees in Africa and uh, freed up their hands. And they started picking up things because now they had their hands freed up from swinging in the trees. And they started picking things up, and not just picking them up, they started using them as tools. And, a, and an interesting thing happened. As they did that, their hands changed, evolved, so that they were better at, using, at picking things up and using them as tools. And their lives got better, because now they could use these tools to survive better relative to how they had done. They were pretty small guys compared to the other uh, animals that were living around at the time. Um, and they were kind of low on the, the food uh, chain. Uh, and so they, they struggled along. But once they got these tools and they could really master handling them effectively, it gave them a, an advantage. And lo and behold, what happened when they got that advantage is they got smarter. They got better diets because they got more protein. They could compete around uh, hunts uh, with other animals and take away some of their prey. And over about two million years, they evolved from a brain around the size of a chimpanzee to these magnificent uh, specimens that we've got at the top of our necks. Right? We became much, much smarter, I would argue, by design. Right? Systematically, and maybe to say by design is, is not quite accurate in that sense, because nobody was intending to make better tools so that they could get smarter. They did not make, make that connection, they didn't understand that. But what they did know is that evolutionarily, if they kept applying their creativity in a systematic way, it would be good for them. And so they evolved into much smarter guys. Um, and and uh, you know the, the 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 creature that Michelangelo imagined when he was painting that 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 painting of Adam evolved. It wasn't created in a in a in a six day blitz. It was it, it evolved over a long period, depending on where you say the beginning of it is six million years, two million years. This this time frame that we're looking at from when 
pre-human uh, uh, species, Homo erectus, created simple tree tools like this, basically picking up a rock and cracking it open and making a cutting edge that they could use to scrape meat off bones and crack bones open and, and get out the marrow, which is how they got that, that, that diet that really grew their brain so much uh, into a modern human being that essentially is the same as you and me, living in a hunter-gatherer uh, way, doing the same thing with slightly more sophisticated tools. Right? This guy here has every bit of design ability and capacity as you and I do. Uh, the difference is he doesn't have a design culture and he doesn't have design consciousness. He doesn't know within his cultural frame, with his whole frame of consciousness, that this is where, how we, we, can, we can make change the world on a regular basis. Right? There's no value judgment whether that's a good thing or bad thing. Um, but that's, that's where we are in the world today. We still have people who are, produ who are creating things, are designers in a very primitive, uh, what I call artisanal way. And then there's us making highly sophisticated uh, things in a modern industrial format. Same thing. We do it because it's evolutionarily good for us. The problem for us is that things got so complex along the way um, that we've lost our way in evaluating what's good for us or not. Because we're dealing with such massive complexity on a massive scale. And I'll come back to that. So having evolved all that way, by the time we did about 70, 80,000 years ago, we were fully evolved as a human being. And it was around the time that we, that we, that we were capable of producing more sophisticated tools and more, more sophisticated artifacts with greater intentionality. We had all the, the cognitive capacity that we have today. We could think out ahead, we could plan out ahead, we could see things in complexities, uh, we could manipulate and handle things with these very, very fine tools we have at the end of our arms. Um, and I would argue that by design, we eventually migrated all around the planet. At that time, we were pretty much uh, reserved to this part of the world here, and over about an eighty thousand year period, we got all the way to here. This was this was actually the last place that humans ever reached on a, on a planetary scale. Uh, we got here about fifteen to eighteen thousand years ago. Um, where we are now, we got to here about forty thousand years ago. We got to here about sixty thousand years ago. So different rates of migration, different movement patterns, but we essentially uh, got around the world because we were able to use our creative intelligence to adapt to any single environment we got into. If it was high in the mountains and it was freezing conditions, we could adapt. If it was down in the plains and, and stiflingly hot with hardly any rain, we could adapt. We, we adapted by design. And design is really at that level, if you're taking it at a very high, high uh, level of ethics, that you're looking at what it is when we use this creative impulse, it's an impulse to adapt. All right? And with that impulse, we've created all kinds of amazing things, incredible things. And I've showed you some of the terrible things, but they are amazing and beautiful things that we've created. And, and things that allow us to do what no other creature on the planet has been able to do, which is adapt to every single place on the earth. And now we're trying to figure out how we can adapt to living under the ocean and how we're learning how to adapt to living on the moon or on Mars. And we do already, we have already adapted in a fairly complex way to living in space. It's remarkable. It's absolutely remarkable. And it's all done because someone set the intention to be able to adapt to that environment. It's done by design. All right, so that's... Any questions so far? Going through a lot, a lot of different material here, a lot of stuff. We'll go to eight. 25 and then we'll take a take a pause all right
no questions, I'll keep forging on through. So there was a, a next stage in how we applied this adaptive intelligence that we, that we evolved over the millions and millions of years. And it's what I call artisanal design. When we talk about design and designing stuff, we're really talking about a practice and a discipline that we've only been thinking about for about years. There was nobody talking about design. There were no specialist designers 200 years ago. People who designed the cathedrals didn't think of themselves as designers. They were, they were artisans. They were builders. They just happened to have ideas about what they should build. And they did it in a very sophisticated way, and they were very uh, amazingly uh, uh, creative about it. But they didn't think of themselves as designers. If you go look at all the history books, you won't, you won't find the name of the designers of, of battle technologies or the designers of the Hagia Sophia or the designers of, of, of the, the, the cathedral at Shark. They were just they were, uh, they, they, were, they were masons, they were builders. So those people went around, but they were designing stuff, right? We, the, by the definition that we've been using here, that the intentional creation of new things is design, and the, especially when it has some kind of adaptive impulse behind it, uh, is design. And the people who, for, for a long period of time, from about the time that we started settling down, what, in, in, in built environments that we call civilization, right? Uh, so we designed civilization, we designed cities, we designed places for us to, to live in community, close to each other where we could intensify our ideas and we can intensify our technologies. And in those conditions, the makers were the designers. Whoever was making stuff was designing it, but they weren't thinking of it as two separate things. Making stuff was designing stuff. Because how did you know what, what when did you design it? Your, your, the older generation told the younger generation, this is how you make these things. They weren't just telling them the craft, they were telling them the design. They were showing, telling them not just how to make something, but what to make. How big it should be, what, what it should be made out of, where to find the materials, and even how to decorate it. Right? And so these are artisanal cultures where people are evolving slowly. One of the things we know about artisanal societies, from an innovation point of view, they go pretty slowly. Innovation is not encouraged in artisanal societies, but it happens. There's incredibly beautiful things that come out of them. Incredible diverse cultures uh, emerge, but they're not at an accelerated pace that we have come to expect in industrial society. <clears throat> Artisanal cultures have their own consideration of who is responsible for the creative act, their consciousness around it. Uh, the Greeks believed that uh, there was a god of the forge who was responsible for how all the metal workers made their stuff and what it is they made. They believed that their designs were inspired by the gods, right? And so that was the belief system of an artisanal society where there were individuals making amazingly innovative things, but, but uh, attributing the agency for that, for that to the gods, to others, to someone outside of themselves. Oops, this is telling me my connection is lost. Oops. All right, and just like we have artisanal designers and there's artisanal industry to make, uh, we've got industrial designers to design things for industrial industry, the artisanal designers had their own industries. And one of the characteristics of artisanal industry is that artisans would make the whole thing. You wouldn't get a, uh, a, a dressmaker you know, having uh, sort of outsourcing the sewing on the buttons. They would make, they cut the garment, they sew the garment, they put all the buttons on it, they do it. And there wasn't a, a radical division of labor that we now consider to be 
an essential part of modern society. And then came the Industrial Revolution. And what the Industrial Revolution was built on was a premise. We tend to think of the Industrial Revolution, the major innovation of the Industrial Revolution was mechanization. But before there was mechanization, there was what I call a radical division of labor. This is an illustration of Adam Smith's uh, pin factory. Who knows who Adam, I think we talked, I asked you about Adam Smith. Do you know who Adam Smith is? And what did he do? He was the, yes, right, of the market. Right, and more importantly than that, was actually the idea that someone gets people. Um, because people should be able to do different arts and ways in the country. Like, instead of being specialized in, you know, all five and so on, he took part in so much so much. Exactly, yeah. And it was part of, it was the introductory chapter, chapter to his very famous book called The Wealth of Nations, which was really the, the first theoretical treatment of an emerging economic system that we call capitalism. Right? It was built on how do you maximize profit? How do you harness capital to generate wealth? And one of the ways he figured out that you can do that, because it was starting to happen around, he was observing what he was seeing, was that the people who were most profitable doing that were the people who had the most rationally uh, organized workforce. He basically said, we're not going to use a high-end um, master craftsman who makes pins, and they're going to make the nicest pins in the world. We're going to set up a factory where we can take the manufacturing of pins and divide it into 18 discrete tasks. So each person only has to learn one 18th of the skill set that the master craftsman has to learn. It can be very much simplified. And a side benefit is if you, if you divide tasks down so finely, uh, the, the side benefit is, uh, is that you can mechanize it. It's much, much easier to mechanize. Back then, they didn't have the kind of sophisticated mechanization that we have now, um, they, was, they were just getting going. That's why I say what preceded the mechanization was the division of labor. But when, when Adam Smith talked about dividing the manufacture of a pin into 18 discrete parts, which part did he leave out that is essential for the manufacture of the pin? Bingo, right? Nobody thought, wait a minute, who's going to design pins in the future if, if we just say, and it was left to design specialists, right? So things actually uh, got a little bit wayward and, and everyone was trying to wonder how do we take these art, art, artifacts that are being now made very, very efficiently in the industrial revolution because of mechanization, because of the development of the factory system, because of the division of labor, but how are we going to restore quality back to them? And the first people who started worrying about it in a systematic way, who started thinking about it, were people who were concerned about the quality of the goods being made, both from a manufacturing point of view, it was degraded work for those who were making, who were just doing repetitive tasks. So anyone who's seen Charlie Chaplin's movie called, it's called, Charlie Chaplin's a Beautiful Charlie Chaplin movie about modern times, yes, uh, where he, he really looks at that notion of people doing repetitive tasks again and again uh, and what it does to their spirits. But, the, but the, the arts and crafts designers weren't the only people thinking about designing stuff. The other people thinking about designing stuff was a new group uh, that hadn't existed before the Industrial Revolution, really emerged from the Industrial Revolution, which is engineers. Engineers, industrial entrepreneurs, these were a new, the new groups of people, and these are the people who took it upon themselves to think, oh, let's make a pin like this. Let's make a, a, a car like that. Let's make all these new artifacts uh, that were coming out of the Industrial Revolution, out of the, the incredible innovation of the Industrial Revolution, were mostly <coughs> being regarded by the people who invented them and who engineered them. But they, you know, we go back to our, 
uh, hierarchy of needs, and they were mostly attending to the needs pretty much down here. There was not a lot of human-centered design going on. And the people like the arts and crafts people, William Morris and that, they were really trying to think, all right, how do we make this better for people? And that was, in a sense, the beginning of human-centered design, the idea that every artifact is designed and every artifact is designed to help people live better. The question is, what's the ethical approach to what we mean by better? So design from its very inception, you go down the, the tradition that goes back to the arts and crafts movement and the early design thinkers, the early people who said, wait a minute, there needs to be a, a, a specialist, a new kind of, of person working in this division of labor who is dedicated to the quality of the thing being made. We'll call those people designers. And that's where our notion that design is all about aesthetics, that's where it comes from. Because right from the beginning, it was assumed that the utility and the functionality would be left to the engineers or the entrepreneurs. And, the, and these specially trained form givers would who were attending just to the physical quality of the artifact would be called designers and they'd be responsible for making nice things. Which means that if you weren't in the, in the market for something nice, you didn't get that kind of designer. Right? Which if you think about it in adaptive, in adaptive terms, in evolutionary terms, you know, nature doesn't choose which tree to evolve well and which tree not to evolve well. They're all highly evolved and the, the utility and the aesthetics are indivisible. You can't, you can't separate them out from each other. So there's a, always from the beginning of design, there's been a, an ethic that says, if you're going to make it, make it well. That's an ethic. The early designers also were arguing a lot about where is it, if, if design is a form-giving discipline, where is it that we get our forms from? And for the longest time, all the way through the Industrial Revolution, all the way through the, the, the early part of, of the Industrial Era, the, where the, the top industrialists looked for their forms, where they found things that, were, that they said, well, let's make it look like that, is they looked to the Greeks and the Romans. They looked to the classics. They said, Let's, if it looks like the pot, if we're gonna make a pot, make it look like a Greek urn. If we're gonna make a, uh, you know, a chair, make it look like it's decorated, that, that it came from, from, uh, from Greece, right? That was not a very sustainable strategy because obviously they started inventing new things that they didn't even have in classical times. And what are you gonna make them look like? And they started making them look like a Greek you know, electric appliance or a Roman, you know, uh, device of, of some modern, modern uh, invention. And so there were people who said, no, wait a minute, you can't do that. So the, Louis Sullivan was the teacher who, who, uh, who taught, actually trained uh, um, Frank Lloyd Wright, who coined this very famous expression, form follows function. Now we often think of form follows function as a expression of a style, it's modernism, but I want to suggest that it's actually an expression of an ethic. It's good, Louis Sullivan said, to look towards the functionality of a new art kind of thing, and he was talking about high-rise buildings, skyscrapers, which were a brand new concept back in the turn of the 19th century, and he said, if you're going to design a modern building, base its form on its function, not on a Greek building or a Roman building. And that was an ethical position. But it was an ethical position that related only to the way it looked. His uh, student, Frank Lloyd Wright, followed on by saying, form follows function. That has been misunderstood. Form and function should be one joined in a spiritual union. So the very early design thinkers, people like Frank Lloyd Wright, were thinking in much more holistic terms than that these are just different ways of, of styling something. These are not styling suggestions. They are, they are ethical suggestions. Form follows function. 
Thomas Edison, I talked about him before, he basically believed that form that 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 the form of things should be are kind of irrelevant and it's only inventing new utility, new use value that is the only thing that matters. Um, and so that, that was his, his stake in the ground about that. There was this guy, Raymond Lowy, who was considered to be the father of American industrial design. And he said it very plainly, form follows money, form follows profit. Make things that you can sell more of and everything's good. Right, the, the hidden hand of the market, who talked about the hidden hand of the market, will take care of everything else. You just make sure that, that you can sell a lot of them. And, you, and to sell a lot of them, the design, the job of the designer is to make it cool, to make it really hip, right? That's an ethical position. You might agree with it, you might disagree with it, but it's an ethical position. And then, as things went on, we came into the relatively modern era, sort of since about the 80s and 90s, where the idea of human-centered design as a practice, where you're not just considering any one of the, the human needs, but you're considering all of the human needs, um, became a, some people at the time, when, when, when the early days when I was reading and, and people were talking about human-centered design, people were, oh, here's another fad, it's another style. But I hope that do, designing things in a human-centered way isn't a style. It's not going to go out of style real soon. It's an ethic. It's a belief that we've acquired over a long period of practice that says, when you design stuff, design it with people in mind. Right. So let, actually, I find myself, let's take a, a five-minute break, come back a little bit after 25 to, and we'll continue. And if anybody's got any questions or comments, just feel free to come up. Thank you. 
Okay, let's keep going. Any uh, before I start up again, any uh, any thoughts you might have had in the last few minutes? Any reflections? It's very helpful for me to hear what you think about any of this, because it helps me to understand what it what it means to you. Over right. time, we'll get get to more feedback. So the one of the difficulties in proclaiming that design should be good design should be human centered um, is that we have different ideas of what what aspect of of the human should be given consideration. And so the development of human-centered design has, has also followed a progression, if you like, from the bottom of the, the pyramid to the top. In the same way, in a sense, that design practice historically emerged by, from the top of the pyramid moving down, design thinking has sort of, or human-centered design thinking has uh, evolved from the, the, the base of the, the bottom of the pyramid, from the just make it utilitarian, make it useful, give people what they need. Uh, and over time, it's opening up to not just the physiological needs, but the psychological ones, um, things that we call user friendliness, making sure that it's not just useful, but that it's easy to do. And so that was a whole level of consideration. And for a time, everyone said, oh, user friendliness, that's a fad, that's just a style. Well, it's not a style, we're now, have very sophisticated computers that we carry around that we don't need instruction manuals for because of the power of user-centered design. Uh, you probably don't remember computers that you had to type in uh, code just to get to you know, do a simple operation. And you had to be able to program computers if you're gonna use them at all. And it was really user-centered design, uh, design for usability that changed all that in a very radical, and dramatic way. Some people argue that if you're going to design, put, make do human-centered design, you have to be considerate, very considerate of which humans you include in your design brief. And there's a whole school of thought that emerged in the last 25, 30 years is that you should design for universal needs. Everybody has got different abilities. Uh, everyone has got different limitations, uh, physical limitations, um, and cognitive limitations. And you should design for as big a, an inclusive a group of users as you possibly can. Like people in wheelchairs, people who might have cognitive disability and might not be uh, able to read everything, people who are literate, whatever it is. One of the most famous uh, design cases that came out of the universal, or has come out of universal design thinking, is the design of these OXO good grip kitchen utensils. 
Uh, who's everyone familiar with them? What, what, what was the you can you, uh, that's a that's a, a vegetable peeler. What what is different about that vegetable vegetable peeler that makes it universal design? Didn't we know that? You're not allowed to answer that. I think you just um, sometimes a lot of peel peelers where it's, it's can be kind of small, just uh, not be very ergonomic. This appears to be uh, just the width. The gripping looks like it's just very easy to use. A lot of people who don't or can't do it are able to be able to do a lot easier. But it's a very simple observation that the designers made that is if you if you have frail hands, it's really hard to grip something small like a toothbrush. Remember that the most toothbrushes are the really small ones, and at some point, ROB started making fat, thick handled toothbrushes, right? Same inside. Except they took it a whole bunch further. They said, no, really, let's make it a, a good grip is about an inch, of, uh, inch in, in diameter. And let's not just be messing around with a little thin pencil grip, because that's not how you hold things uh, when you're uh, peeling vegetables, which if you're a fit able-bodied person, uh, like pretty much most of us are here with strong hands, uh, that's not a problem. But if you're arthritic, if you are frail for any reason, uh, because you're either too young or too old, uh, or if you've got, uh, you've got disabled disability in the hands, pretty much that's the most usable, universally usable hand grip possible. It doesn't make it particularly much more expensive, They've done it in a beautifully aesthetic way, but the primary intention of the OXO brand has been to design uh, kitchen appliances or kitchen utensils that can be used by as broad of a, a user group as possible. All right, so that was just a, 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 now there's still obviously there's value systems. How inclusive do you make things? If it makes them terribly much more expensive, do you include that? There's value judgments to be made. There's no one right answer, but the objective, the orientation towards making, designing things that are applicable to as wide a user group as possible, that remains a value, it remains a design value that we can give some consideration to as we design whatever we design. And this is the one that relates to that, that uh, the image that I showed of the, you know, the, the commercial considerations, the, the uh, the technical considerations and the human considerations is being the, the opportunity for design innovation, um, but it's always in a context of the of a bigger environment, a bigger context, and that has particularly become relevant as we get coming to understand that designing things to be sustainable, designing things so that we don't crash the planet, is not a style; it's an ethic. And like anything, anything ethical, we can discard it or we can embrace it, but it's not a style. Um, and so we are moving more and more to understand that when we design things, intrinsically, if it's not sustainable, it's not good design. The same way that in 40, 50, 60 years ago, if it was ugly, it was considered to be bad design. Now, if it crashes the planet, that's not a good thing. All right, so sustainable design is another way in which we're evolving the ethic, we're expanding the ethical foundation of what we consider to be good or bad design. Some people are taking it a step further and they're saying to be good, you have to be equitable. You have to be able to make good design available to everybody, even those who might not be able to afford the most expensive brands or those who might not be able to afford any brand at all. How do you design for equity? So this is a controversial area of expansion of design ethic, but there are people down at the D school who've developed a framework that they call liberatory design with that explicit goal. Will it get traction or not? It's just a question of our consciousness. Do we think conscientiously that that's good or bad? as an objective for the way we design things. And just a last reference point for, for what I would call ethical thinking in design is something that I sent you a link to, to watch uh, uh, this whole piece. Uh, 
show of hands who, who has watched it. And what would you say the single takeaway is of that uh, Tristan Harris, you see in the image over there, what is he trying to say? What, what is he saying? Anybody who has watched it? So uh, that image exactly is what I think the essence of the video is. So on the left side of it, it he's not saying that we need to reinvent this video. He's just saying that we have to make moderate changes, and that he doesn't have the answers. But uh, thinking in different ways to modify existing things is the way to go. Well, what can we talk about a particular kind of thing? Uh, right? and, uh, um, well, he's talking about how technology is. Um, you can't just turn off the notifications, although that was his first point. Um, he's saying that it's not just that simple, and um, there's uh, that list of uh, things to incorporate so that people aren't so um, addicted to it. Right. So basically, he's concluded he's, he's an ex Google engineer. He was actually a, a employed at Google for many years as a design ethicist. And he at Google said, wait a minute, this stuff we're doing is terrible. It's not good for people. We're, we're actually building the, all the, the design criteria that we use, give users what they want, uh, disrupt everything. Technology is neutral. Uh, etc. These are, just, are ethical positions that are untenable, and they were ethical positions that were driving Google's design. Right? And he said, no, that's not, that's not good. We, we need some different ones. And, and he wasn't getting any traction with management, so he left. And he started an organization called the Center for Humane Technology. And the Center for Humane Technology, amongst other things that they're doing, uh, has developed a new set of design criteria. We'll talk a little bit more under the, the part where I say designing is the thing that we forget. So I'll talk about the different, different considerations that are brought to bear in designing things. Uh, but a lot of them are called design criteria. The criteria by which we, that we consider when we're trying to get something designed. So for example, um, design to convert users is, is a design criteria. And he's arguing, wait a minute, some of the, the criteria that we hold are wrong. We should have good criteria. So good design comes from good, good criteria. And these are the, on the right are the ones that he was advocating for in this particular talk. I'm not gonna go into them in, in detail now. We'll talk about some more about them later on. But what essentially is he represents to me is a new wrinkle in this emergence of ethical thinking or what I call ethical design. Is that there are people advocating, they're actively the design activism is becoming a thing. People are advocating for certain kinds of design um, ethics, design considerations. And he's out there, he started an organization essentially to do what? To lobby the government, to lobby, to lobby industry, to adopt better practices and better principles around the design of technology. Right. It takes many forms, and, and design activism isn't brand new. I mean, they've all, they've from, you know, the, the, the universal design movement was a design activist movement. It still is, but it, it, you know, at its inception, when there were some hardcore uh, activists around, they, were, they actually activated uh, and, and got the law changed in this country. Who's, who's ever heard of the American with Disability Act? That was the people who got us the universal thinking, got us the American same group, same kind of people, but in a smaller group, but they work to change the law. It says if you're going to, to create cities, you've got to create it for everybody living in the city. You're going to uh, design buildings, you're going to have an accessible uh, access for people in wheelchairs. Right? And that was the ADA. So that was an early form of design activism, but this is the one that's emerging now that's relating to how do we design technology so it doesn't make us dumb. It doesn't addict us and, and get us all hooked into things that aren't necessarily so good for us in the long run. Uh, for those of you who've watched, who haven't watched this, I highly, 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 um, I mean, you, it is a requirement of the course, but obviously I can't sit on your shoulders. I'm not going to know for sure who, who has watched it or not. 
it's about an hour. It'll be very helpful to you when you actually get to the designing stage of things because it actually is very practical talking about how do you design apps. What are the design considerations when you design an app? And I'm pretty sure that a lot of you are going to be thinking about designing apps in, the, in the, this course. All right, so this is a really good uh, source for that purpose as well. So we'll come back to the original um, statements about uh, what I call the, the, the description of our of a normative uh, design consciousness, uh, that we live in a world of artifacts. Every artifact is designed, not every artifact is designed well, but it can be, right? So that's, that was the starting point. But a few things are getting in the way of even that design consciousness. One of them is you, somebody uh, referred to early on that we're going through this period of massive, massive acceleration of technologically driven change. Right. This is a graph that shows the rate of change in technology from to the entire period of civilization from 10,000 years ago, 9,000 years ago, until a point about the middle of the, 19th, of the 20th century. And with all these technologies were coming along in systematic fashion, um, and when suddenly, right around uh, the, the middle of the, the basically around the time just after the industrial revolution uh, but really into the middle of the 90s when we start the acceleration um, of, of the, the technology that we use that, that define the world that we live in and that we as designers are trying to design applications for as fast as we possibly can so that we can adapt them to be good for us rather than not. Right, so obviously this only goes up to the genome project, which is already old news. We're developing technologies now that are, are coming along faster than ever. Artificial intelligence, genetic engineering, robotics, uh, all kinds of material sciences. I talked about the buckyball earlier on. All kinds of synthetic biology, where you can actually start designing um, plants and designing foods. Uh, it's coming along so fast, and the people who are going to make it user-friendly is us. We're it. We're the ones who are going to take all these technologies and get the most and the best out of them, rather than be fearful of them and worry that they're going to um, destroy humanity as we know it. Right? So that understanding of what I call the, te the technological acceleration is a thing. And it's shifting our consciousness. The second one is the one I talked about before is, is that we, we are recognizing that doing this is not okay. You know, you, if you look at the, the way we've shifted our understanding of what is it okay to, do, to build over and what's not okay to build over, where can we lead light and not lead light, you just have to look at the Bay, San Francisco Bay. You know, all the way until the middle of the 20th century, there were industrial facilities lining the bay that were pouring toxic waste into it. They, they were landfilling it and everything. It's really only in the last 30 or 40 years, everyone said, wait, wait a minute, we shouldn't do that. We should, it's, it's a natural beauty in the middle of our city. Let's keep it natural. It's a whole different level of thinking about uh, how do we design the, the cities we live in? How do we design the environment? It's a shift in our ethical position relating to whether we just pave over nature or whether we design with it and around it and in it. So I just want to add in a few thoughts to what I consider a very contemporary design consciousness. And the one is, the one that I've, I've mentioned a few times, we are capable of creating anything that we want. Right? It's really, we can get anything we want. The technology now is so powerful that we can create anything with it right there's no fear there need be no fear of scarcity because we can generate enormous amounts of wealth with incredible power of technologies we can synthesize materials we don't have to worry about running out of any material we can generate as much energy as we want without consuming the planet right so we're living in, in with the technology we have we're living in an incredibly abundant time we can create anything we want 
And we're, what the, the corollary of that is we also realize that we can destroy everything that we love. We are capable of changing the climate of destroying the planet, right? If we really don't pay attention to it. Which means that the, a new ethical position emerges that we have to design with care. We have to be careful about it. We have to care, care for the, the outcomes of what we're creating. It's not just, woohoo, let's have a party, we're gonna create anything we want. What do we want is the real question. Because if we design what we, what we think we want superficially without attending to the consequences, we're not going to like what we design. We're not going to love the world that we design because we're actually designing the world in its totality. And so the last of those expressions, we need to create what we value and what we're going to be doing, applying uh, reflective practice to consider the value that we have in the design stuff, because that's what we're going to design, what we value. If we value it, we should work on it, we should create it, and if we don't, if we think it's a bad value, then we shouldn't, right? It's as simple as that. So that's the reflect step. It's going to, we're going to reflect on how we design, how we apply the methods, and whether we're doing a good job, which is, that's the most central element of what we're going to be doing here, most critical. And we're going to attach to that this notion of we have to design what we value highly. And therefore, we have to have reflective practice around what our values. What is it that we really believe? What is it that we really want for ourselves, for the planet, for the people we're designing for, for users? Um, we'll talk a lot about users uh, over time. <clears throat> <coughs> I've already talked about that. So when we talk about <coughs> designing, oops. these are the things that designers think about, and I'll talk a little bit more about the parameters and constraints, right? But I'm going to suggest there's another thing that designers should always have is a lens. And the lens is the value system that we bring to the design process, and it's how we decide what it is that's good design or bad design. And I'm gonna suggest, because we're going to be doing some exercises with this lens, we're going to do each of you on your own, and with your teams, are gonna be creating your own design lens. And there's only four things that I offer you as a framework for doing that, is you're gonna be considering the purpose of what your design challenge is, what's the purpose? What are, what are you trying to accomplish? And you said the design, what's the intention? Right? You said a lot of things that were designed by design is with intention, with the purpose. So what is the purpose that you're designing for? The second is what is the expected impact? What is the outcome that you're expecting? And what are the outcomes that you're not expecting? That you can stop and think and do some thought experiments consider what the outcome might be if the thing that you're designing were to successfully be implemented at scale. Right? Because the other thing that we're living is, is that we're living in a commercial world that operates at scale. Everything that we invent, everything that we design, we're kind of designing the Silicon Valley model is to design something that's going to be so just ubiquitous. Millions and millions of things are made. So we can't be thinking small. We have to understand, extend our imagination about the impact of what we design to the scales in which they might eventually be applied. The third is the category of agency. You've heard me talk about agency a lot, about when we think of ourselves as a creative species rather than attributing the creative genius of everything we see around us to some higher power. We actually recognize we are that higher power when we work in collaboration with a lot of other people, right? So and we have to take that, that that's, a, that's a tall order. It's like, wow, that's pretty heavy. Well, it's heavy and we have to take it uh, seriously, understand it, and we can't be, uh, we can't have hubris, we can't have arrogance around it. We have to recognize our agency 
but we have to think about who else is involved with us to design the things that we design. Because we keep on going back to the central premise, design is a team sport. We, no, no, nothing is ever designed by one person working in isolation. It's always a collaboration between many, many people. The question is who are those people and how well are they included in the decision-making around the design. And the fourth is the, the, the question of context. Are we thinking through the environment that we're placing the things that we're designing into? Okay. So just to ap operationalize these a bit, um, you at three points through this project, remember I said there's going to be a, a three-phase process, going to be a, a phase one, which is going to be uh, mostly research and training, phase two, which is going to be concept design, and phase three is, that is, three is going to be developing the concepts to a point that you can pitch them. And that's says research, concept, and pitch. And at each point as you, through that process, you're going to be making fundamental decisions about the thing, your, your, your design project. In the first one, you're going to be choosing the challenge. In the second one, you're going to be narrowing down from many concepts to a single one that you're going to continue to develop. And the th in the third one, you're going to be considering how you pitch the idea that you've developed, right? And in each one, there's going to be what I call a design inflection point. You're going to have to make some decisions. Yes, this, no, not that. Right? I'm going to take this challenge and not that challenge. I'm going to take this concept and not that concept. I'm going to take this prototype and not that prototype. And when you do, you're going to, in your team, is going to be sitting in reflective practice, asking not necessarily these exact questions, but these are my suggestions. These are your, your, your cheat template for when you do this practice, these are the kinds of questions that you will be um, asking each other, which is whose purpose, for example, under the purpose or intention uh, category, whose purpose is being served by this process? Who is left out when we give them our attention? Are we okay with that? And if not, what might we be able to do about it? These are not questions that have got simple yes, no answers to them. They, they need to be, uh, delved into, and within your team, you're going to have a conversation. The point is to be able to do that, whether it's self-reflection on your design process or self-reflection on your the ethical positions, is how to have conversations like that respectfully of each other, how to work towards a, a point of agreement. This is definitely going to be disagreement. But the point is you're going to have to keep on going because you're, you're on a team together, you're designing something. And the question is, how do you move towards agreement with each other so that you can move forward and, and, and be effective? Right. Impact. I'm not going to go through all the questions. Now, are, are the expected outcomes of this project good for everyone? If not, who might it affect negatively and how? Are we okay with that? If not, what might we be able to do about it, et cetera? And you can generate your own questions, and I'm sure if it's an open and heartfelt conversation within your team, other questions will emerge, right? So what I'm gonna want from you is for you to be able to have the conversation, record some of what is being said, and then at the end, write a summary statement that will be part of your final report. That phase. Okay. So you're going to have to do the conversation and then report on it. And I'll talk a little bit about how to report on it and how to tell good stories. Agency, who gets a say in what ought to be designed, right? We take it for granted. Oh, some, the marketing department told us, like who told the marketing department, right? Who needs to be included in decisions about what we design in the first place? And are we okay with leaving certain people out of the process? Sometimes it's just not practical, but you know, practicality is only a, a relative statement about value. It's not, it, I don't value it enough to spend any time or resource on it. Well, if I value it highly, I'll do it. If I don't, I won't. So the question is within our value system, who do we include, who do we not include, who do we exclude? 
There's a lot of uh, rational research that, that has been done to show that well, the more people you include, the more structured opinions and, and, and ideas you structure with your process, the more likely you are to step through the market. That's not necessarily an ethical uh, argument, but it's a valid argument. And so we, we weigh our understanding of what is effectively good design practice with achieving good outcomes. And contexts. Have we sufficiently considered how our project might impact the environment at the immediate level of use, at the local level, at the global level? Again, these are big open questions. You may have strong ideas about them while you're doing the project, or you might find that you don't know enough to even ask the question, right? If it's a big question and it's people in the group who feel it's an important question to answer, you might have to go out and do some research. You might have to go investigate what the question is asking you about. But these are heuristics, there's a, a big word, I'll use that a lot. You know, everyone know, know what a heuristic is? Who knows what a heuristic is? So it's a term that's used a lot in, 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 in uh, research, in, in uh, uh, qualitative research especially. A heuristic is a rule of thumb that you can apply to evaluate something. It's just a rule of thumb. That's a fancy word for a rule of thumb. Um, so these are, I don't know where I was, these are heuristics for, for being able to ask questions that, that, that can suggest where you need to find more things out. Do any of the technologies we plan to use present a distinct ethical challenge, right? We, we all the time, a lot of the design, what you're not gonna be doing is inventing new technologies. You're gonna be scanning the horizon and saying, here's a technology that's interesting, we can use it like this, right? It's not up for you to figure out how the technology works, how to make it work, how to solve for some of the technical problems with technologies if they're very new technologies. But when you choose technologies, they've all got an ethical dynamic about them. People are very concerned about artificial intelligence, their entire ethical organizations, considering what, you know, what are guidelines for, for, for designing uh, artificial intelligence products ethically. There's medical ethics boards and groups that really research these questions really deeply. The question is whether you need to go refer to any of that inform yourself about technolo technologies you're choosing to use and what the risks are of using them. The information is existing. The problem with actually having such an information rich environment is it puts it on us to actually go use that information when we make big decisions. And then the last thing that I'm gonna go introduce now is, is just this question, what is your design consciousness? Being aware of yourself is the starting point in doing anything, anything ethically, right? So we're going to do an exercise to understand our design consciousness. You actually already did the very first piece of the exercise, of exercise it was filling out that value survey. You're going to now write an essay, a personal essay of what your design values are. It's going to be about 500 words, it can be a little bit more, I don't want it to be much less because then, then you're hardly saying anything. And I want it to be a description, your own argument to yourself about what it is you believe about is important in, in design and what's, and what's unimportant. What do you value and what don't you value? Okay, I've got a, I've got a, br a briefing sheet that will describe this in more detail. You can go back and look at the value survey, I've, I've put this online so you can download it. Um, because I only gave it to you in uh, as, as a form. And you, if you can't remember exactly how you filled it out, that's okay. My guess is, and I'm actually very curious, as you look at this now, can anybody say whether they just based on this discussion we've had, whether you would you would complete this any differently than when uh, when I when you did last week. I would say easy to use just because they mainly that's a vegetable peeler. You know, a lot of people sometimes I take for granted people have problems with Parkinson's, whatever that one, you know, maybe MS, something that they, they really need a, a grip that mm -hmm. they have to grips to be able to do with the single path. And it feels like tables. So you would elevate yeah, ease of use? Yeah, like three or something. It's like, it's, you know, it's, it's 
not super important, but there's people who actually have to do the task. Yeah. Anybody, anybody else change? Um, I'm not sure what we put, but now I'm thinking about it. Uh, it's like can make the world a better place by design. Definitely after listening today, Okay. Anybody else? I think my perspective is kind of changed on, or like uplifting, but how important is it? I don't really consider it that important. I just think like if it functions, it does its proper job, and it's good enough. But like not going over the last thing, it happens more than just that. Yeah. Good. Okay. One more. Anybody else? Gosh, nobody uh, shifted their their uh, estimation. There's no right or wrong. I mean, it's really this is just your values, and there's no right values and no, no wrong values here. I, I, you know, I'm not too sure how to talk about the first one, but I think I would have a hard time meeting certain things that are not able to word that is by the law or like whether or not we can access technically we can't get a little bit and then we are like cool with them because we're like right. so that's kind of like I think I had a hard time answering your question at least um just because I definitely think that it's kind of challenging okay good good okay last one when the design invaders have opportunity to everyone um here we are so for me it's like we it but like seeing all the, 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 the um, design of Russia, really it's a, it's a one for a lot of people. Right. So these are these are should statements. They should, right? Yeah. They, they don't always have it. So how do we how do we deal with that? Yeah. So what you're going to do is 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 uh, write a what I call a reflective essay. That's what is what is my design consciousness. Um, this pretty much says everything I've been saying and write a short 500 word essay reflecting on your own beliefs, values, and assumptions about what we as a society are capable of accomplishing by design, what is most important that we strive for in our designs, and what the personal, social, and natural forces are that get in the way of good design, right? That's, a, there's, you can't research this, you can only think and, and, and relate to yourself about what is it that you believe these are provocative questions. There's a lot of different ways you can approach it. There's a few reasons I, that I want to do this. One is I think it's just very good for you all to do this kind of reflection. Um, you're going to do it again when you get formed into teams. And I'm going to form you into teams two weeks time. Um, and at the time, one of the first things you're going to do as a team is sit down and have this discussion. And then you're going to write that up, as I said earlier on, and that's going to be part of your phase one report, and then your phase two report, you're going to do it again, and, and, and phase three report is what is your, your ethical estimation of, of the things that you're working on. But this is going to start with this uh, as, a, as a benchmark to say, as a team, these, this is what we value, so that when, you make, when you're making design decisions, you can look at how you make the decisions against your value system, which doesn't mean you sh that your values are wrong. It just means you might get a deeper understanding of how difficult it might be to, to actually work within those uh, parameters. Because values are, are a high bar. And I think it's appropriate that we set a high bar, but then once you set high bars, you gotta, gotta work with them. And one way you work with them is by lowering the bar, for specific circumstances, or by changing the design. It's all easy, and you can move them towards each other. That is a practice that I want you to be very comfortable and familiar with, because I hope you will get to do that all the way through your career. All right? Uh, this is online. This is in the iLearn, so you can download this and read it and pay, pay, take your time with it. Um, I do like to have essays given to me in class. But I will also create a, a spot online in, in iLearn for you to upload a PDF. It's just helpful for me to have the PDF versions if, if I need to, for some reason my the version you give me. But I, I, on the day of submission, 
bring a printout of your paper in to hand into me and upload it to the to the website. Okay. And PDFs, please, because what I found last semester when people gave me Word documents, I don't use Word, I use Apple Pages, and the formatting really just goes kablu. Um, so, especially if there's graphics in it, uh, if there's images in your um, in your Word document or your Google your Google Doc document, it just doesn't go well for me when I when I open it. All right. Um, let's take a five-minute break, and oof, we're going to really run over. Um, let's take a three-minute break, and then we'll we'll get going just a little bit before twenty past. Thank you. Um. How many people here like to have and would find it valuable to actually have a PDF of these slide decks available? Oh, okay. So I, I did put up the slide decks from the design thinking uh, lecture and from the one where I introduced myself last week. So those are up in iLearn. Um, yeah, they're available to you for you to download. Hmm? Apple what? Is this uh, about the essay? Yes, this is the essay. Yeah. Yeah. It is on my own, yes. Oh no, that's a different one. There's, a, there's another one up there. I'm going to be talking about that one in a minute. Um, I think there's two. Oh no, this is this is this here. Yeah, yeah, this week. So the line value on the same side. I don't know how to on other. Oh. So, it's not, so this is okay. I've just learned something new. This is not online. I will add it online, and I'll put it in next week. Actually, no, I'll, I'll put it. I'll put it where it should have been this week, and I'll. I'll put it'll be in that same. same week. Do I? Do I? I don't know the different format. So I, my, my requirement in formatting documents is that they're designed so I can read them, <laughs> right? And, and which means it's your design skills, graphic design skills, communication design skills to how do you lay things out? Where do you include, you'll, this will come up more, not for this, but for, for later on. How many illustrations? What kind of illustrations? What's the relationship between illustrations? Do you caption the illustrations? All those questions are design questions. And so I don't give you a format. I want you to give me a format. The requirement is it's got to be easy to use. It's got to be attractive. It's, it's, got, to, it's got to reflect your design values. 